I'm with Keith Delmar, and we know each other for about 20 years. And what I love about this is that uh, he's in New Zealand, and I'm in Uruguay. And actually, he's from the US. Uh, you were born in Florida, uh, or? Yeah, I was born in New York. In New so York. So I grew up in upstate New York. Oh my gosh, 20 years. It's too long. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And you still have Form 2 headphones. Yeah, yeah. These are the ones my wife bought me when we got married. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> because I didn't, yeah, my Form 2s, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have them anymore and they went on. So, so imagine uh, this triangle between Uruguay, New Zealand, and the US. Um, I find this quite amazing. Yeah. Because we can get uh, our audience the perspective of these different cultures in a time that is quite unique for the world. And this is, I would say, one of our obje objectives of, of this uh, conversation. Mm. Uh, New Zealand has been in the news quite a lot um, because of how it dealt with the pandemic mm -hmm. um, in such a, a unique way, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, you have been without any cases, positive cases for about three weeks. Is that correct? That's right. I think it's 16 days right now. So, Okay. Only one active case or no, no, none yet? Uh, one active case at the moment. That's yes. right. And none of them in hospital, I believe. So. Okay. Yeah, it's really uh, encouraging. Yeah, but you had a quite strict quarantine, right, for some weeks or months? Yeah, so early on, uh, New Zealand closed its borders and we went into a, a lockdown. And it seemed we had a lot of cooperation uh, from companies. Um, I work for a larger corporate um, it, it, in the middle of the, the country. Uh, the country, as you get closer to Auckland, gets more metropolitan. And as you go down, <laughs> it gets more country and rural. Um, but uh, the corporate that I work for, uh, they closed, they went into lockdown before lockdown actually happened. So okay. they, sent, they sent everyone home. It was 500 employees uh, to work from home before the lockdown even hit. So and how how did how did it feel i mean how how were you, your friends and your family and your um neighbors how did they experience uh, this lockdown i mean yeah I'd be curious to um you know you, you get this perspective from more and more people um but here in new zealand it uh it was a real sense of calm uh, although there was nervousness of people worrying about contracting the virus uh, overall, uh, things be life became simpler really fast. So, um, no cars on the street. Uh, people would walk places. Uh, well, m the places they, they were walking were more just going for a walk with their family to get some fresh air. And so you saw a lot more families and neighbors, although we were separated, um, speaking over fences and, um, keeping our distance on the street, there was a real camaraderie of, um, of, of, of people uh, following the rules to keep everyone safe. So it was a real uh, uptake of, of the rules, especially in rural parts of the country. Um, in more uh, metropolitan parts, it was quite difficult, especially with uh, shopping centers. Uh, where you have a more dense population and people waiting waiting in line to get in to get food, whereas uh, in other parts of New Zealand, uh, with less population, it was much easier to go into supermarkets and things like that. Um, but overall, my family has uh, really taken it on in terms of um, we enjoyed having that extra time together and being at home. Luckily, I built this cabin that I'm in right now. I built oh. this just. I, I, I built it just before lockdown and it was for an Airbnb, um, but it be quickly became my office. So. <laughs> Amazing. From what you describe, it, it, was, it seems it was not 100% mandatory. I mean, whenever you wanted to go out, you could go out. In a so sense. you could go out for walks, um, but you had to stay two meters from other people. Um, you, you could go out of your house. Now I was, 
a, um, a primary caretaker for two elderly people in my life. So I have permission to go visit that bubble um, and take care of my in-laws. And so on a daily basis, I would go and I would visit them and take care of them. And, and then I would come home. So we had a very small, uh, just two, two households. Um, but if you were to go out for walks, which you could, you could go out for a walk, you did have to keep your distance from other people. So it was, it was very strict in that sense. And you yeah, couldn't, go to the, couldn't go to the beaches. <laughs> and that was very strict for New Zealand. <laughs> okay. Were you stopped by police if you start walking or, or it was only if you were driving the car or yeah. how, how did they implement? I mean, if when, when something's mandatory, I mean, you have to have some force that will sure. actually do it, right? Yeah, in the in the city uh, in Auckland, uh, it was much more uh, driven by police and people getting stopped in cars. Um, again, when you're walking on the side of the road, you could you could go places um, and, and go for a, a short walk, um, but you had to stay within your town. So if if somebody if they were suspicious for some reason. They could ask you for your identification and say, you're, you're very far from home. You need to go back home. Um, such as my father-in-law, who sometimes took very long walks and uh, wandered <laughs> a bit too far out of his neighborhood. Um, but especially, we tried to keep him at home just because of his age, um, because there was a mandatory, uh, anyone over 80 years old, they, they, they weren't supposed to leave the house at all. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge with someone who had a memory problem and um, wandering around the neighborhood. Now, um, with uh, enforcement here in Taranaki, which is the part of the country that I live in, uh, was very light touch. Um, everyone was playing by the rules. Um, there were no so cars. Actually, there was yeah. actually not needed. There was not needed. There was no, it was so much cooperation and so much public cooperation that most people wouldn't let a friend go for a drive there would be encouragement from within the family that they shouldn't be driving. So there really was no need for enforcement in this area. Um, in the cities, there was a uh, need for um, <clears throat> some, some policing of sorts. Um, particularly, we had a holiday uh, during, during the lockdown, a New Zealand holiday, and some people did try to travel. Of course, this was in, uh, I think this was going into level three or level two, Um, and they did get tickets. So there was 600 people caught driving, um, trying to go on holiday. <laughs> well, uh, we heard the news about the health minister, uh, I think yes. it's called David Clark or something like that, that did that, right? Yeah, he was the one right. that has a good yeah. example. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he used his job as the example, and unfortunately, he doesn't have his job anymore. He doesn't so, yeah. have it. <laughs> no, going, you know, expressing, you know, your, your, your Kiwi lifestyle during lockdown was not, not a good idea, especially when everybody else is trying to really follow the rules. I was on Facebook and suddenly Facebook just show up, uh, uh, Jacinda Ander, Anders uh, uh, show up mm -hmm. uh, with a conversation with a psychologist. And, okay. uh, and uh, it was, and I started uh, watching this video and it was, I was really impressed. This, this is the first time I had a contact with her. And, and I, find it fantastic and the way she was actually talking to a psychologist but actually talking to the people and to young people and to kids and how to actually manage this time uh, watching some other youtube videos and and uh, even i saw her uh, on sort of her pajamas uh, uh, <laughs> talking with see. you know talking i don't know you can tell me more because <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, But, but I find it amazing that a prime minister, or it's called prime minister or president, yeah. I don't know. Prime minister. Um, she, she will um, have such a direct connection with the people as a normal person. Uh, we are not used to that. Uh, do you think, you, you can tell me more about her and, and how yeah. it influences you and other well, people that you know. And, uh, and if this has a lot to do with the success of uh, New Zealand with uh, coronavirus. Yeah, um, before Jacinda came, came to be our prime minister, um, the country, I guess, we show, up, we show up a lot of places. 
um, I think the population is very, uh, lots of ingenuity and um, Kiwis travel at around 21 years old. They all um, have what they call their OE and they go and they travel overseas, much different than my experience in America. Um, and so a lot of Kiwis travel around the country and I think spread this very positive uh, feeling about their homeland. And uh, the country in general is, uh, I, I believe, um, a very positive, you know, it's a very positive place to live and lots of good feelings. And when we have a prime minister like Jacinda, who is a really, she's a very real person and, and you're right, she really connects with the population. Um, there will always be people who politically don't stand in her, her arena. Um, however, um, not a, maybe not as a human being, but because of her policies, maybe because of her policies. And, um, sometimes, yeah, they'll take it too far, but, um, she, she has a, a way of really connecting with people. Um, I'll give you an example that I sent her a LinkedIn request <laughs> and she accepted. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So, and Amazing. I said, and, and it's, it is the beauty of New Zealand is it is a small country. We have, um, just around 5 million people living in the, in the country. So we have a lot of space, um, but we have a lot of meaningful connections. And I sent her a message saying for what area I'm living in, if you need any help here, let me know before you come. It, <laughs> because I feel like I can do that with her. Um, uh -huh. and, and yes, and uh, I saw the video you're talking about. I think it was a Facebook Live or something yes, on social media like and she was at home in her her Levi's uh, sweatshirt getting ready to have dinner with her family and just being a real person and that really um, just shows uh, just makes her an amazing example for my daughter uh, who's seven years old and we get to talk about our prime minister and our politics through the view of our of our leader of our government and um, how she acts in situations, we get to tell that story to our daughter um, and our son. And that's really powerful for me um, to be able to be in a country now that I feel so supported by its government. Um, and sometimes I think Kiwis, who is the, the New Zealanders of, of New Zealand, we call them Kiwis. So I'm, I'm a yes. Kiwi now. Yes. <laughs> I have my passport. Uh, but I, I also have an American... Now. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, I uh, always uh, try to take the both perspectives of knowing what it's like to grow up in America and have the American perspective and then to have the politics that we have in New Zealand is much different. And um, yeah, just there's a few other things I'd, I'd like to mention just about walking into this country 10 years ago and being so welcomed in immigration. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So in, in the immigration office, I was I was shocked at how calm and peaceful it was, and the people were kind. Um, there, you know, a much different experience than I had in America. Um, not to say all the experiences in America would be the same, but um, right now I'm very happy to have um, our leader in New Zealand. So, well, actually, you are from New York, and this is one of the cities that was worst hit by the pandemic. Uh, you have right. friends there, I, I suppose, or some family yeah, members. Yeah, my, my whole family is still in New York, so. Um, so you live that experience as well, in a sense. Yeah. And um, and when you had conversations with them, uh, did you try to advise them in regards to what your experience was in your own new home, or what? what, yeah, what it was. was, how it, was, it, was it? It was challenging because there was a different perspective from what they were getting on the, the, the news and media from what we were getting. So when we had levels starting at four going down to one, um, I believe my mother was talking about starting at some level one. They were moving into some level. Um, <laughs> now, but unfortunately, um, the most disappointing thing was my mother, who, who's worked, um, she's always worked in customer service and retail stores. And she's been working at Home Depot for 21 years and in America. And she, she had to work the entire time um, because oh. the Home Depot was considered an essential service. And it was so disappointing to think that 
um, a hardware store as an essential service when all the construction companies had to stop working. So I found that really difficult uh, to, to cope with. And so did my mom. Um, she was, you know, forced to wear, she had to wear a mask the whole time, of course, mask and gloves. And she said, um, although that was really uncomfortable and it caused her some respiratory problems, just having to breathe through the mask eight hours a day. She, um, the most difficulty she had w was with um, other people being very, um, I guess a lot of the people coming through were very stressed and, and very angry. And um, they, uh, at one point, she said that she was helping a woman with her credit card get it through the machine. And the woman got very upset with her that she had touched her credit card and that she contaminated her. And she had a, there was a big scene. And here my mom was with gloves and this woman had gloves. They both had masks. And my mom decided that she would go home that day at that time. She said, I think I'm ready for a, you know, a day off. So she took a holiday. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, you have two sides of, uh, of how you can experience a country in which uh, one country is all together um, in, 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 in a common, um, uh, not only strategy or how to cope with this, but, but embracing the government uh, with, with their policies so we can um, fight this pandemic and actually beat that pandemic. And in the U.S., you have so much polarization, and uh, and and a, and and a leader that we are not getting into politics because it's not our, the, our purpose of our conversation. But but uh, but in in terms of uh, of how you feel um, that moving to another country in which you you don't you don't sense this polarization and, and at least in pro, in problems which are really health issues that shouldn't be happening. Maybe right. in other issues, is, is you, you have it in New Zealand and it's, it's okay. Um, were you feeling frustrated? You just forgot about what's going on there because you don't live any, anymore? Or what can yeah, you tell us about Sorry. Yeah, it, coming from America where um, there's so many uh, different, pol the, the different issues between states and how they deal with things, Um, is so different at a government level, at a state level, where in New Zealand we just have one government and we have different areas, but we're all controlled, we're all under the one government. So there is no issues with different towns wanting to do different things. However, early on, um, there were certain areas in the country that had higher, bigger issues, um, more metropolitan, um, more people. Um, but thinking back, um, from growing up in the States and the different feelings are it, as you go from state to state, it, it's almost like a different country, each state as you cross and you get into the different areas. So how they're reacting, there's just uh, not having the cooperation is real struggle um, for my, for my parents um, and not having clear communication. And what I find here in New Zealand is there was really clear communication and I think that's what made the difference so everybody in the country knew what the next date was it's it's mm -hmm. kind of like good planning for any business you know when your next meeting is you know when the leader is going to talk to you and you're going to have some resolve so having really clear defined timelines uh, allowed everyone in the country to plan their lives and not get caught up on it where as in America there was no clear plan of action and no clear communication where immediately in New Zealand um, we had, we had dates that we could look forward to as a country to wait for the next message. We were given weekly updates by Jacinda on, on television and um, we really had a, a clear idea of where we were headed. So that was, that um, was. I, I've seen that you have some, street demonstrations uh, with, um, with what is happening in the U.S., Black yes. Lives Matter, and, and you have them in Auckland too. This is true. Um, Auckland is our, our main city um, where you, you, we would find demonstrations. Um, But global. why would they have a demonstration for that? Um, I know in many countries yeah. that they're doing that, but uh, 
I would like no. to know the reason why in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand, we have to realize this, you know, we talk about, and I'll, I'll continue to talk about how much I love this country um, for the rest of my life um, and how it's a different place to live. And um, there's a whole many reasons for that. But at the same time, we do have uh, racism in this country. We do have a population um, of, of different races. And, um, and we, so every day in New Zealand, racism occurs. Um, we have a Maori population, which is the indigenous population of New Zealand. And unfortunately, the, these young men are targeted and just like in any other country, um, not just like in any other country, but we do have a problem where our prisons in New Zealand, which we do have prisons, are full of young Maori men. This comes from different, uh, we do have gang culture in New Zealand. So there are gangs. Um, they have uh, black power, mongrel mob, and it's more visible in New Zealand actually that we have gangs than in somewhere like New York or in America, or I don't know what it's like in Uruguay. Um, but they're more visible because we're a smaller country. I mean, there are some of these quote unquote gangs that deliver food to people's homes. So mm -hmm. they're, they're a gang, but they're delivering food to hungry people and their houses and they're, they're helping in the communities. So there's a mixed relationship between uh, police and gangs and the general population. Um, but one thing that I, I believe the young people of today are really tired of is, is racism and judgment on, on the way someone looks or, or the color of the skin. So um, racism happens everywhere and including New Zealand. So uh, something like Black Lives Matter would uh, quickly be supported in this country as well in terms of protests. Now, um, the way they're getting violent in America is really hard for me to watch. And um, the, the anger that comes along with it and the way the anger is expressed. Um, so the other day I went out onto the street myself and took a different type of approach. And I, I took my, I took my camera and my microphone and I went and interviewed people on the street and just asked them to share share some love and kindness with the world. And, um, and it was, it was really beautiful moment for me it, for 42 minutes. I walked around and talked to about 10 people. And it, for me, it was just proving to myself of how much goodness there is in the world. And if we were each, each of us were to go and walk around, we would be overwhelmed with the positive, uh, the, the positive messages people have to share. Getting rid of your own fear too, right? Like that's a fear for you to put yourself out there and be out here today and you're doing that too. So well done for Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> and and you're spreading the love to us. Yay! So we can't be overwhelmed by the, the images that we see on television and the violence we see on television with protests because it's a very small percentage of people that are very angry and very uh, in a situation perhaps in their life that is, is not very good. And I also... Growing up in America, I grew up in a I grew up in a trailer park, and in, in in a very, let's say, in a more poverty situation than most people, where we didn't have very much money, and life was really simple. Um, and I remember growing up in that area, and the area that I grew up in was so bad that they called all the children in the area they called them turf rats, and the label the place where we grew up was called turf. And it was a turf trailer park. It was a really wonderful name for a place. And so the adults in general would call the kids turf rats. And we would, growing up, hearing that you're a turf rat, what does that make you want to do? Does that make, you know, so the group I grew up with, I'm sorry to say, but um, they've either died or are in prison now. Um, oh. And my one friend, my best friend, almost died and now has a traumatic brain injury. And he lives at home with his mother. And um, that's it. Everybody else, I don't know where they are. And, you know, I know by 18, they were mostly in jail. And so growing it up, up in an area like that, I can sympathize with the anger and the aggression. Because to think if something happened like this, and I was back then and I was 16 years old again, 
I might have jumped in and thought, I deserve an iPhone 11. <laughs> I should go down to the store and get my iPhone 11. My time has finally come. But I, I've lived a different life now, and I know and, and I can, can appreciate just um, all the love and kindness in the world and that we don't need to all these material things um, to be happy. So Actually, did you move to New Zealand because of any of those reasons? or I, I moved to New Zealand for a complex series of reasons, but when I decided, I decided at about 22 years old um, that I would move to New Zealand. And it was uh, during the first, uh, it was actually after September 11th, 2009, And I didn't, I didn't appreciate the way the government was handling everything in the country at that point. And I felt like, as a young person, I, I didn't really feel safe um, with the politics and with with the country. And I, I felt like I needed to 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 move away. And it took a it took many years after that. It took 10 years after that um, to actually come to New Zealand. Um, but here's where I met my wife, and. <laughs> Um, and I kind of know why I'm here now, so, but yeah. And you have two beautiful kids. I sure do, yeah. And yeah. Um, it's a, it is a, an amazing place to have a family. Um, and I feel very blessed to live in a country that I can support. But at the same time, I, I, still, I still have uh, good feelings about America. And I want to see, uh, I want to see things change. And they are changing. Um, and I want to be able to support America too, but it is very difficult, um, you know, not being able to travel so freely and, um, having it be so expensive to travel back. And also from, from my perspective for years, I've been scared, um, physically scared to go back to America because I was an American. <clears throat> and one of the rules is in America, if they considered you a, uh, if the American government thought you might be a terrorist they can keep you indefinitely and so in my life i know somebody in america who was kept in detainment for uh, a period of time and it was really scary someone very close to me so having that threat um was was a bit too much for me to want to go back to america so i stayed out of america for all this time i haven't been back since but but well, why would you i mean you're all peace and love why <laughs> why would you be scared uh, about that Well, no, the reason I, I would be um, feel uh, scared is just um, not wanting to be, uh, you know, I don't know, confused or, you know, with someone else or something happened. I, I don't think it was very founded. It's not a very founded fear. But now that I'm a Kiwi and I have a Kiwi passport, I'll say, you know, send me back to my little island with um, <laughs> in, the, in the ocean. So... It seems that uh, it's sunrise at this moment. Yeah, it's sunrise no? on the side. Yes, it is. And, and here in Uruguay, is sunset. <laughs> I can so see your sun going down. It seems you are in, on level one or you are going to level one this week? We'll be on level one this week. So uh, in two more days, we'll be at level one, which means um, all businesses will be operating as normal. Um, and... Uh, restrictions including distances between people have been lifted will will be lifted however the government still asks people that if you do not know the person to keep your distance and then also um, they're asking everyone to keep track of where they've gone so they're putting up QR codes everywhere they're asking people mm -hmm. to use their phone to keep track of of where they where they go This is mandatory, uh, or is and this? It's not mandatory, but it's 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 being highly recommended. I know that within the organization that I work, um, they've asked that. Again, it's not mandatory because they they don't feel like they can enforce it, but they're asking every employee to keep track of everywhere that they travel and the different places they go, so that if anything were to happen, they could quickly react. So, yeah, it's. Uh, And the, the only it's, thing that's being lifted is the travel restrictions. You know, they're not opening up the airports. And, and you, you might be the first country doing, doing that. So you will, you will set the example and you will show the way to, to the rest, rest of the world.
we, yeah. we are doing quite well in Uruguay and, and the quarantine here was voluntary and uh, we only had two people that died and uh, we have some days with only one case or two cases uh, one day with without positive uh, tests um, but uh, but it will we we'll still have a few months to go I mean and we are not an island uh, so we have a we are half of our um, territory is uh, by Brazil and Brazil is in really big trouble and, and mm. we are going to get cases from there yes. um, but uh, we are watching you so you tell us more or less what are the success stories and what we, we have to be careful that you might not have implemented well I have my first business trip at the end of the month and um, I've already booked my tickets for the internal flight so they're sitting everyone in the plane you're only getting half of the seats of the plane. So mm -hmm. um, I'll let you know how the first flight goes. So and, you've, um, that's a, it was always some good part. You will fly it uh, yeah. comfortable. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Keith, one, one of the things that really got our two countries together was the cruise ship, uh, Greg Morton. Um, I don't know if you, you've seen this in the news. Uh, and yeah. We can tell our audience that this is a high-end cruise that was in the south waters of uh, tip of South America, mm -hmm. and um, and they had a stop in in a small town in Argentina. I don't recall the name now, and and they got COVID nineteen, and uh, actually after that they they were finding a place that they will they will allow them to to leave the, sh the ship and, and uh, it was it was not allowed uh, uh, well you had many uh, other cases in japan japan yeah. as well and and uruguay was a country that accepted them and uh, actually uh, our people were very into the story and when they left or they managed to to leave the ship uh, we were in the streets and we were with flags cool. and, and we awesome. were really happy that uh, of the yeah, stories and <laughs> and it's really emotional and uh, uh, so I don't know what what you've seen of these stories. Uh, it makes a big account. impact. Um, it ma it makes a big impact um, for for New Zealanders, especially when we're flight restrictions ha have been lifted. You'll see a, a larger group of New Zealanders and Australian flying to Uruguay to um, <laughs> to visit and go on holiday. I'm sure. No, it's um, it's also it um, this whole crisis has given certain countries the real opportunity to show their true colors. The hospitality, friendliness, and humanitarian assistance provided by Uruguay has warmed everybody's heart. We know from news we are getting a lot of countries are not treating people as wonderfully as the people have of Uruguay have treated us. All of us, and I think I can safely speak behalf of on all of us, have, Uruguay has done a wonderful job. And we, all of us, are exceptionally grateful for your doctors, for your assistance, and for everything that has been done to help us get home and to make it as easy as possible, no matter where we live. And so, you know, allowing the ship to, to disembark in your land is um, it goes a long way for people around the world. So yeah, stories like this, uh, when you shared it with me, it was, it's really nice to see. So, uh, one thing, one real difference in living in New Zealand, um, has been the way I've been living and, um, the rules around things. Now, when I was in living in Auckland, my, my wife and I decided to build our own home because housing prices in New Zealand are really, really high. Um, you'll have to do the translation with the um, money, but it's you can't get a home in Auckland, which is our main city, for for less than five hundred thousand dollars. So, and that's New Zealand dollars. So, it's very expensive to own a home in New Zealand. Um, so, we decided to take the thirty thousand New Zealand dollars that we had, and we would build our own home. So, we built uh, two nice. Mongolian yurts. So, we built this home. Well, our daughter, we thought we would build it um, and have it done before our daughter was born, but it took a little bit longer and um, as good projects do. 
Um, but we built a home and we lived in it for four years in Auckland on a, um, a farming paddock. And um, it was a beautiful place to live, very close to nature. And uh, being, make, making it ourselves was uh, really special. Um, and now in New Zealand, they've just changed the rules that you can actually build a, a 30 square meter structure without a building permit. Um, and basically what this means is th the likes of tiny home living or to build a Mongolian yurt, you can do, you can do that on your own property without going through a very expensive process. Um, at the time we were, we just built our home temporarily and we could take it down. Uh, but now we could actually put it up permanently and um, have it be completely legal and, you know, the council will be very happy. So, so that's very exciting for New Zealand. I think especially with the housing, the way it is in New Zealand, the cost of housing. I mean, our house here in Taranaki costs $400,000 and it's a very simple, small house. That's why I put a cabin in the backyard, <laughs> but it's a beautiful house. So, <laughs> so. But we have our own, we have our own bush, our own trees in the backyard, and our own stream. So, it's not too bad for being in town. And uh, for us, building yurts was a challenge because I had to make a decision that I wasn't um, following all of all of the rules. Um, I was making a temporary dwelling um, to live in, and I had to decide: okay, the structure that we were building at that time wasn't permittable. However, it was safe. And it was, it, you know, it was a safe home with um, electricity done by an electrician. And uh, um, I did all the plumbing, but um, yeah, it was uh, a completely safe place to live. And so having, looking back on that now and now knowing that the government has changed their view on that and saying, no, it's okay. I feel much better on the decision I made. <laughs> leading my own leading my own family's decisions not trying to break the rules or get in anyone into trouble but knowing that it felt right to build that home and um yeah looking back now and now that it's perfectly legal to do the same thing is feels really good so <laughs> I'm, ha I'm happy to have, happy to have done it and had that experience so congratulations and thanks and <laughs> uh we we still have our yurts um in storage now so whenever we buy another piece of land that's a little bit bigger, we can, we have a house ready to go up two days. We can nice. put up a house. <laughs> so, oh, nice. good. The company I work for, I'm a, you know, they gave me a nice big long title, which will look good on my resume. But um, what is it? Tell me. Mar marketing strategist and, or no, senior senior marketing strategist and innovation advisor. So. Oh. What I do for the company is even, I, even you uh, have to think about the title. I do. It's too long. <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, but I get to bring new technology to the company in terms of media, and um, I'm always looking for uh, kind of whether it's holograms or different visual graphics that we use within the company to communicate to each other, uh, different uh, tools. Uh, I try to keep the tools really simple. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise we have one team with monday.com and one team with, uh, with teams from Microsoft. So, um, just looking at different innovative tools, but also we communicate with, uh, one and a half million customers that we have. So, so what, what is the company about? What, what yeah. do they do? So the company is actually a, um, a government regulated monopoly. And it's a, a lines company. So we provide all the electricity to all the different, um, different communities. Um, and we, we cover about, um, well, there's, there's four areas in the country that we cover and we distribute the electricity to those, com to those areas. So we're basically a power company. In New Zealand, they've broken it up into several different types of power companies. One power company generates the electricity. Another one sends it down the highways of the country. So you can imagine it generated in an area and then the electricity gets sent kind of up the middle of the country. And then there's line, lines companies, which is what my company is, and that distributes it to the communities and brings it to the front door. 
And then they have a third company, which is the retailers, which sell the electricity to the people. So mm -hmm. um, we're in an interesting situation or interesting place in the business where we, um, we're in charge if anything goes wrong. So if, if the power goes out, we fix it. Um, the company that I work for, uh, if we, and, and of course the major thing is making sure the network is up to, up to date. So replacing, replacing power poles, replacing transformers, making sure the electricity is of a good quality. So, um, I came to that job from the food industry for 12 years. Um, so being in the food industry, I was in the organics industry and I moved to Taranaki and there was no jobs in the organics industry. So I had to shift my skills to a new industry. So that was very challenging, but, uh, you know, communicating with people is, uh, it's always the same. So you just, you know, do it. With do you know what, what percentage of the energy that they produce is from uh, renewable sources? Yeah. So, um, I don't have those stats right in front of me, but uh, uh, majority, uh, yeah, you're looking at um, over 50% is hydro and wind. So we have quite a bit of hydropower and quite a bit of wind power. And uh, quickly, coal generation, uh, coal, coal power generation is decreasing rapidly. So we do have a very big dairy industry, which Uh, it's quite complicated because the way they process the dairy, um, they need a lot of electricity. And up until this point, they were, they were burning coal and now they're burning wood and um, they're just looking at different, different opportunities now to, um, to actually power these facilities, whether it's a paper mills or, or milk and dairy. So mm -hmm. here in Uruguay, we almost 98% is from renewable sources. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yes, and our wow. country is similar in a sense to New Zealand in terms of uh, diary and, uh, mm. and pulp uh, companies. Uh, because mm. we, with South Africa, Uruguay, and New Zealand, we share more or less the same type of climate. Mm -hmm. So we compete in the world too. <laughs> Competing on the world's markets. Um, yes. Well, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a really interesting to um, be in a whole different area of, of skill. So coming into this industry, I had no idea about anything uh, to do with electricity, except for that I had, I wanted my own solar powered system. And uh, right now the, the company on a whole, we're an electricity, distri electricity distribution company. So we move electricity around. Mm -hmm. But what's slowly happening is uh, people are having the ability to move their own electricity. So even here in New Zealand, there are um, certain parts of the country you can charge your car and drive it to another part of town and charge someone's house. So um, people are starting to move their own electricity. So... It, it really changes the model. So right now we're doing, um, doing some big work on surveys within the country to try to understand what people are thinking about and where they're, are they thinking about buying EVs? Are they thinking about having solar power? Because everything that people do on the electrical network um, changes the way we move electricity around. So if everyone on the street gets solar power, all of a sudden there's a real different need Uh, for the way we set up our electrical system. So that's very, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And it, it will, you know, change eventually that we have to decide why are we here? If everybody's moving their own electricity and creating their own electricity, what are we doing? Why not? Why not? Yeah. So, um, so we're trying to learn ahead of time what's happening so that we can be a part of it, of course, and help people move electricity safer and, uh, you know, better. So, In, in a sense, there is no limit in how much electricity people will consume. So the more you generate, the better, but we have to do it in a renewable way because of climate change. And yeah, that's really important for the future. What do you think about the sustainability of, um, I'm all for renewable energy myself, but what do you think about the sustainable energy of things like solar panels and um, this kind of renewable energy? 
We do in, much in prefer hydro. In, uh, uh, the actual the actual production of the actual panels and the battery sources to store um, the electricity. So renewable is great, um, but we do run into some issues with with different batteries. Uh, I don't think yes, I don't think you can do any sort of uh, uh, generation. I mean, even if if you take winds, I mean, you need the, the mills and, and these. You need to manufacture. Of course, need, yeah. There's there's no nothing of human activity so that will not affect the environment in some sense. This is so true. you you do have to make some modeling and calculation and see. Right. But but at the end you can recycle and you you can see how much of this material the world still has, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you have to set priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and but today one of the main priorities is that carbon levels on the atmosphere is at the highest levels in three million years, mm. and uh, if we don't do something, we might be in big trouble in yeah. just a few decades. One of the things that I think about, um, and I'll just put this out there, Jimmy, just because we're talking and it's really enjoyable, yeah. so I'll just keep on going for a minute. Is yeah. um, I've been uh, thinking about writing a, an article. Um, and entitling it still still going west and um, for me what that means is um, in America growing up and learning about American history and how they the whole going west and um, taking of indigenous land building on it uh, taking from it what they need um, and this was done primarily removing people from land, changing people's lives, taking land. And I think in general, we don't feel like we're still doing that as a population, that mm -hmm. we're still taking indigenous people's land. I think we look back at history right now and, and I, I feel the, the general population would say, well, we don't do that anymore. We don't go to villages and burn them down, take the resources, and uh, re relocate people. However, by not connecting uh, with the land, by not thinking about maybe how do we how do we get our food? Where is it coming from? Well, actually, the pandemic that we are experiencing now it has to do a lot with taking natural habits. Uh, from plants and animals and, and, and moving humanity there to, to take the resources that at one point we, sh we have to stop. Because if we don't, I mean, this, the, the, the pandemic is, is certainly caused by that, mm. uh, by, by affecting the natural habitats. There are hundreds or thousands of coronavirus virus in, in, in the natural habitats. And, uh, and we have to keep them there and we don't have to manipulate them no. because, because uh, human beings could be a risk. I mean, yeah. this is what we are experiencing now that we might experience it in the future. Even, even it could be even worse. Mm. Um, and also we don't have a right to do it. No. Uh, it's not just because of our own sake. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's this one planet, and it's one planet for all living things. Um, That's right. But this is just this is awareness. We need some, right. we know, we need people awareness to get into that yeah. um, because it might not come natural. Because our natural is is is. I mean, to to eat and to get a, ho a home and mm -hmm. and and to travel and but. But you need yeah. higher consciousness to know that yeah. this is a finite world and we have to, you know, take as little resources as possible. And that's more yeah. important than, than other things that we might feel like doing. Yeah, and that's, that's like, that's the message I'd want to send to as many people as possible is to take an inventory of how they live their lives and reflect on recycling and how much how much how much waste do, does a household produce now yes. my house we fill up one rubbish bag or one bag of rubbish 
will take us uh, about a month and a half to fill. Um, everything else is recycled. Uh, and that is just because the way we purchase things and the way we use, you know, so if when we're, when we're buying something at the supermarket, we look at the packaging, uh, what kind of packaging it's in. Uh, and also we try not to shop at the super shop at the supermarket too much. We like to buy things in bulk. So instead of buying one kilogram of rice, we buy five kilograms of rice. Um, but beyond, beyond even that, just thinking about the technology we have and what we own going back to those kind of base principles of uh, thinking about what we own really carefully and why we want the things that we we're going to get, whether it's the house, how big does the house need to be? What do we need to put in the house? <laughs> well, th these months we were forced to understand what is really important in life. Mm, this and, is true. And but material things are actually, we realize are actually that not that important. Of course, uh, you need some, you, you need to satisfy your basic needs. I mean, you, you, need, to eat, you, need, you need a home. But other, other than that, um, we have to come to the realization that there are other things which are actually more important. And uh, I mean, you are a father of two kids, and for you, yeah. I'm sure what's more important is what is, is ahead for them, and not sure. for you. And, uh, and, uh, and as, a, as, a, as any parent, parent, you you have to be worried, and and, and this actually helps you um, uh, bring up your awareness of, of these issues, right? Yeah, and just teaching the kids how to garden, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to grow and, their own and food. it's amazing when you do it i mean you would just yeah. a small a small piece of land so so much things you can do and then you can say yeah. well you know yep um well we have a small small piece of land a very small property here in town and um we're growing our own food forest in the back so um nice. we've got about 15 trees and two gardens uh so It'll, I'll have to let it grow up before I show you any pictures because right now they're all very young. But um, you got to start somewhere. And um, it's, a, it's a real practice for us because it takes time, seven years before we get a lot of fruit. So mm -hmm. we're going to be, we're gonna have to practice our patience. Um, <laughs> so it'll be interesting, interesting space to watch. Yeah. But, well, uh, the more you wait, the more happy you are when you see the results. Yeah. And, um, you know, just the more living each day, living with no regrets so you know doing the things we want to do and not holding back and if we feel like we need to do something like make videos yes. and interview people jimmy you yes. go out and you do it no regrets <laughs> so, cool. what, what i like about this uh, conversation that we have is that i started interviewing you and then you end up interviewing me <laughs> <laughs> it's a Was it's a net i guess the natural natural path sometimes yes my last question, I, I heard that there's no snakes in New Zealand. Is that true or is it just not true? That's, that's very true. <laughs> yes. yes no, how could it be? So we have some very unique um, creatures. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't have any bears and no snakes and no really dangerous spiders. So that's good. Wow. <laughs> and they're very Anytime. serious. When, when I yes. came to New Zealand, I made a, a mistake. I, um, I had three apples in my bag that I forgot to take out in Los Angeles and I forgot that I had them and when I came here it cost me three hundred dollars <laughs> because it was a I had to pay one hundred dollars for each apple that I brought um, so they're very strict in terms of what comes into the country so make sure that when you come in you claim anything okay well I want to go because they tell me, they tell me it's an amazing country it is an amazing place and there's lots of places to to go hiking and run and um, come visit and I have this beautiful cabin here once yeah. we finish it, you can come and stay. <laughs> thank you, Jimmy, and thank you, everyone, and take care. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. That's fine. Okay. I'll be happy to connect. Take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jimmy. Bye. Bye-bye. Go ahead. What, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> I was saying that, um, of course, when the cameras go off, you know, Jimmy, you, <laughs> I just want to say that you've been a real inspiration in my life. Um, when I first met you, um, I was, let's say, 20 years old, roughly 22 years old. And um, you had such a clear vision on what you were doing and such a, you did it with kindness. From day one, 
you walked into uh, the store in South Florida and you, you took every day and every step with kindness. And it, it meant so much to me as a young person to see somebody that was so interested in technology and had a different way of thinking. And it made me believe that I could totally go forward, have a different way of thinking, run uh, a, a high-end business uh, and, and do it with kindness and, and respect. And so I just want to say thank you for all that you do and all that work you do and you continue to do. So if someone doesn't follow you on the different channels, I would say encourage them to go look at your photography and um, everything else that you do, which you just continue to express yourself. So each time I see you on the social media, I get inspired saying, wow, Jimmy's just done another run. He's just done another thank photography. You so yeah, so <laughs> thank it, it you really so means, means a lot to me. So thank you. Thank you.